<clears throat> okay, let me share the screen. So we're going to continue uh, continue on with uh, with with uh, uh, slide set number two. So we had just talked about uh, various energetic materials, uh, the fact that they burn by themselves. So uh, so the so, so the last slide we basically wound up with we were discussing ammonium perchlorate, which is a strong oxidizer. It's used quite a bit, uh, and, and potassium chlorate and and sort of other things. Now. To determine the amount of oxygen or the amount of oxygen that's available in the molecule itself, uh, parameters such as air fuel ratio uh, uh, and equivalence ratio don't make much sense. So for energetic materials, they are often characterized by something called an oxygen balance. And again, this is needed because EMs burn without any additional oxidizer. And so we need a measure to indicate how completely oxidized it is after, uh, after it burns. And so the oxygen balance is defined by the mass of excess oxygen uh, uh, atoms that are, that are left over after fully oxidizing the, uh, the carbon atoms to CO2 and, and all of the hydrogen atoms uh, to H2O. Uh, and so it's the mass of those atoms divided by uh, the mass of one mole of the compound. And so and I'll have an example of this because this is a bit of a mouthful. It isn't a nice little definition. Uh, it's a very wordy definition. Uh, but oxygen balances can be positive or negative. Uh, if it's positive, it means that the energetic material has more, uh, has more oxygen atoms than is needed uh, to fully burn all the carbon and hydrogen. So these, for obvious reasons, these tend to be used as an oxidizer. Uh, and some materials have an, a, a negative oxygen balance. Uh, this indicates that you need more oxygen uh, to completely burn all of the carbon atoms and the hydrogen uh, and all of the hydrogen atoms that uh, 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 that, uh, that 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 are in the, uh, the compound. And just uh, a quick side note is that uh, TNT is the classically is classically one of the most uh, 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 a pretty poor energetic material, and it has a extremely negative oxygen balance. And, and we'll calculate it uh, uh, in, a, in a little bit, but it's about like minus 70%. And energetic materials, if you detonate an explosive and it has a very negative oxygen balance, they tend to produce these very bright fireballs. So here is a, uh, a result of something called the minor scale test. And what they did is they uh, they detonated uh, what 4.7 tons of ammonium nitrate and fuel oil, which which has a negative oxygen balance, and so that produces this big giant fireball. And so if you see a big giant fireball uh, from an explosive, uh, that means that it, that usually means it has a very negative oxygen balance. And if the oxygen balance is equal to zero, it indicates there's a perfect amount of oxygen. And I'm not aware of any energetic materials that have an oxygen balance of, of exactly zero. Okay, and so we'll just have an, an example here of how to calculate the oxygen balance. So here is RDX, uh, it's C3H6N6O6. Uh, you can look up online, its molecular weight is 227.117 kilograms per kmol or grams per mole, same, uh, same difference. So first to calculate, um, uh, uh, first, to, uh, first to calculate the oxygen balance, you take note of how many oxygen atoms there are in the compound. So there are six of those. And you take note of how many uh, carbon atoms there are and, how many, and, then, and then how many hydrogen atoms there are. So there are three carbon atoms. And those, if fully oxidized, will form three carbon dioxide molecules, okay? <clears throat> Then we need to deal with, okay, then we need to deal with the six H atoms. So if fully oxidized, those will form three, H, uh, 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 three, H2O, uh, three H2O molecules. Okay, so if the carbon and hydrogen is fully oxidized, we'll have three CO2 molecules uh, because of these three carbon atoms and three H2O molecules because of the six hydrogen atoms. And now, in those sort of uh, uh, in uh, in those fully oxidized products, we then count up the number of oxygen molecules. So we have uh, we have three moles of CO two, 
And for each mole of CO2, you're going to produce, uh, uh, you're going to need uh, uh, two oxygen atoms. So that's six right there. And then for, and then we have three moles of H2O. And for every mole of H2O, uh, we are going to, uh, uh, we are going to need, we are going to need, uh, we're going to need one oxygen atom. So there's an additional three right there. So if you count them up, you have six plus three. So that means we have nine oxygen atoms in the products if they're fully oxidized. And of course they aren't in real life, uh, uh, but here we're just pretending. So then we define the excess atoms as the number of oxygen atoms in the, uh, that a number of oxygen atoms in the molecule, which is six, uh, minus the number of oxygen atoms that, the, uh, uh, that are in, that are in the completely burned uh, fake products. And so we have six and we're going to subtract off uh, the number of O atoms in, in the products, which is nine. And so that produces, and so that produces negative three. And so we just take the mass of those oxygen. Uh, we just take, um, we just multiply this number divided by, by the molecular weight uh, of an oxygen atom and divided by the molecular weight of RDX. And so that's basically what I did here. And so we have our excess, our excess O atoms times the molecular weight of, of oxygen divided by the molecular weight of RDX. And so we get negative 21.61. Okay, so it's sort of, um, it's more of a procedural definition than anything. Um, and, and, and after you do, after you do a few of them, you, uh, you start getting the hang of it. Okay, so are there any questions with this? Okay, so then we will <clears throat> do something that's, that's slightly more complicated. Uh, we'll do an, an oxygen balance for ammonium perchlorate or AP. Now, what makes AP difficult is that there is this chlorine atom in there. And so <clears throat> now remember, uh, chlorine atoms are very strong oxidizers, uh, or chlorine and fluorine for that matter, are very strong oxidizers. So they take precedence over oxygen atoms. So if you have chlorine or fluorine in your, uh, in your, in your molecule, the chlorine, the, uh, the, uh, the chlorine or fluorine will oxidize or will react with uh, uh, the carbon or hydrogen atoms first. So if you have, um, and so if you have both carbon and hydrogen in the compound, uh, it will preferentially act with the hydrogen first, then the carbon. And if you have both fluorine and chlorine, I'm not aware of any compound that has both of those. But theoretically, if you had both of them, the the uh, uh, the fluorine would the fluorine would basically take would, would basically take precedence. So here we're just going to do an example with ammonium perchlorate, uh, basically using that oxidation hierarchy, where the chlorine takes precedence over the oxygen. Okay, so the you can look up online the uh, the uh, the molecular weight of ammonium perchlorate is 117.49. So again, we go through the same, the, the, same, the same procedure. We count up the number of O atoms in the compound. Well, here it's simple, there are, there are four. So we have four oxygen atoms in the compound. Now, now we need to uh, start oxidizing it, but we also have one chlorine atom. So we have, we have, we have this one chlorine atom and that's going to react with uh, that's going to react uh, with the hydrogen uh, to uh, to form the stable oxide HCl, and so and that was in our table that I showed uh, in slide set number two. Okay, so the stable oxide of chlorine and hydrogen is HCl. So we have one chlorine atom, and that's going to react with that's going to react that's going to react with exactly one of these hydrogen atoms. Uh, to form uh, to form one mole of HCl. Then after that, we now have three hydrogen atoms that are available to react. Uh, that are available to react. Uh, uh, available to react uh, with the oxygen. Okay, and so. And so basically, um, that will form. Uh, we have three H atoms left. And so that will form 1.5 H2O, uh, 
H2O molecules. Okay. So, and there are zero carbon atoms, so we don't need to do any further oxidation. So we just count up the number of oxygen atoms in the products. And we only have these 1.5 H2O molecules. And so there are just 1.5 oxygen atoms in the products if it's fully oxidized. And so here the excess oxygen atoms are four for the number that are in the compound minus uh, the 1.5 that are bound into the water vapor. So uh, the excess atoms are plus 2.5. And then we go and stuff that into the definition of the oxygen balance and we get plus 34%. And so ammonium uh, perchlorate is a very strong oxidizer. Uh, and part of the reason that it's such a strong oxidizer is that the basic, uh, is that the chlorine reacts with one of the hydrogen atoms, and so and so basically there is there is a half mole of oxygen that is not needed uh, to fully oxidize um, uh, um, uh, uh, the H atoms. So, are there any questions with this? <clears throat> where can you explain where the fifteen point nine nine four comes from? Oh, uh, this is the this is the uh, the molecular weight of oxygen atoms. Professor, yeah, does what happens to the nitrogen does not does it not form any NOx components or does no? It just... um, no, we for this analysis you do not consider NOx formation because that tends to be extremely slow. And so in terms of, if you wanna calculate the amount of energy and things like that, that, that are needed, um, you do not consider the formation of NOx. Uh, the formation of NOx tends to be a very slow process. Mm, okay, thank you. Okay, yep. <clears throat> okay, any other questions? Okay, and so again, these uh, the sort of rules seem sort of confusing at first, but after you do a few of them, uh, you uh, you start getting the hang of it. And here's just a small table. Uh, it's from um, it's data from uh, Cooper's Explosives Engineering book, and you can see various oxygen balances for compounds like RDX, uh, HMX, ammonium perchlorate, uh, ni uh, nitronium perchlorate, uh, which is more of a theoretical thing. It's not. It's 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 not very practical, but it is a very strong oxidizer, uh, and various other things. Uh, and you can see that uh, that that you can see that that nitroglycerin is almost uh, perfectly oxygen balanced, but uh, but but not quite. Uh, that's the closest one to zero that I know of. Uh, and also, um, there's also TNT, which I which I mentioned has an extremely negative oxygen balance. So that means that the products of TNT combustion are extremely fuel rich. And then they will mix with the surrounding air and then basically burn again uh, to produce a big giant fireball. Um, okay, so this is just the table, I'm gonna move on. Okay, and so now if you want to figure out what, if you wanna estimate what the products will actually be, uh, we can apply a similar oxidation hierarchy that we did for hydrocarbons. And these oxidation rules get kind of messy because they depend on the presence of chlorine and fluorine, uh, and they even depend on the oxygen balance. And there's, I'm aware of about four or five different sort of hierarchy rules. I'm just going to go over one of them. Uh, and those are the Kistiokowski, uh, the Kistiokowski Wilson rules. Uh, you see those used most commonly. And strictly speaking, these are for energetic materials that contain uh, carbon, hydrogen, uh, nitrogen, and oxygen, uh, and no chlorine and no fluorine. And I will modify it for chlorine and fluorine in a bit. And so their base rule can be used if the oxygen balance is greater than minus 40%. And this is just based off of empirical data uh, and, and just sort of uh, uh, experience over the years uh, from, uh, from experts in the field. So first, in the in the compound, uh, this and uh, this first all uh, any oxygen atom uh, is, it starts reacting with the carbon atoms to uh, to, uh, to form CO, 
So we have C plus O going to CO. Then if there are any remaining oxygen atoms, those react with H uh, to form H2O. So we have, so any remaining oxygen atom undergoes this reaction here, 2H plus O goes to H2O. Then, then you check and see if there are any, uh, any remaining oxygen atoms. And if there are, those oxygen atoms then react with the CO uh, 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 to, form, uh, to, uh, to form CO2. And, and these three steps here should look uh, familiar. And those are identical to the fuel rich oxidizer or the fuel rich or the sort of the fuel rich uh, uh, oxidation rule uh, for hydrocarbons. They, they are identical. Okay, and then all remaining N and O atoms are converted into N2 and, uh, 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 and, and, and O2. So if we apply these rules to RDX, which has an oxygen balance of negative 21.6, meaning we can use, we can use, uh, we can use uh, uh, this rule here. So first we have six, uh, uh, six oxygen molecules uh, and basically three carbons. So first we take all of these carbon atoms and react them with uh, um, uh, uh, and react them with the available oxygen. So and there's six oxygens, and so that's more than enough to uh, uh, to oxidize our three carbons uh, into CO. So that forms three CO. Then after that, we have three oxygen atoms left, and we have six H atoms. And so that is exactly enough oxygen atoms to uh, 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 and, and, and enough hydrogen atoms. Uh, to form three H two uh, uh, three H two O molecules, then after that all of the oxygen molecules are spent, and so we do not go into this. Uh, we do not go into this third step here, and so and then the and then uh, all of these nitrogens here just combine into uh, three combine into three uh, uh, three N two uh, three N two molecules. Okay, and again this is just one of those things you just got to go through the steps uh, a few times for a few different compounds and you get the hang of it. Are there any questions with this? Okay, I'll move on. Now, there are modified Kistiakowski, uh, Kistiakowski Wilson rules. Uh, and again, strictly speaking, these are for um, C are for energetic materials that contain carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, and oxygen, uh, and do not contain chlorine or fluorine. And these can be used, uh, and these, and these ones are typically used if the oxygen balance uh, is less than minus 40%. Okay. And again, these were developed, um, uh, basically these were developed um, just based off of empirical observation. And essentially the modified Kistiakowski wilson rule, it just switches step one, uh, it just switches step one and step two. So step one, all of the H atoms are converted to H2O. Okay, then step two is you, is, is you then take any remaining O atom uh, and react it with, uh, with carbon uh, to form CO. And that goes, uh, that goes via this reaction here. Then step three, you take any, uh, you, you take any final remaining O atoms uh, and react that, uh, react that uh, with, carbon, with carbon monoxide. Okay, uh, to form CO2. Okay, and so, um, and so again, it's the same process. It's just that you preferentially uh, react the hydrogen first, then the carbon, then the CO. And so it's sort of, uh, it's just the same as the unmodified version of the KW rules. It's just steps one and steps two uh, are flipped. Okay, and so if we apply these rules to, uh, uh, to, uh, to TNT, which has a negative or uh, a very negative oxygen balance. So it fits this rule. Uh, TNT is C7, H5, and 3O6. And it's uh, oxygen balance is negative uh, 73, which is less than our threshold. So we, use, uh, so we use this variant of the rule. So for step one, we take all of the H atoms uh, and, uh, and react them with the available oxidizer. And so we have five H atoms. And so that will go to 2.5 uh, uh, H2O molecules, and there are enough oxygen atoms uh, to form these 2.5 moles of H2. Okay, so after that step, we have 3.5 oxygen atoms left. 
then uh, that are available to react with the carbon atoms. And we have seven carbon atoms. And now we don't have enough oxygen atoms to burn all of the carbon atoms. So we only have enough oxygen atoms to form 3.5 uh, 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 carbon monoxide molecules. And then after that, there are still 3.5 uh, uh, still 3.5 carbon atoms left. And so those just form uh, basically pure carbon, which is soot. Um, and then the and then the then the then the three the, the three nitrogen molecules uh, go to straight uh, go to 1.5 molecules of N2. Okay. And so if you apply these rules um, uh, in, in a stepwise fashion, uh, you will get basically this. Uh, you will basically get this uh, 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 these estimates for the products. Uh, are there any questions with this? Is there a reason why steps one and two are switched? Can we physically explain that, or is this just what they're seeing in experiments? And I think this is based off of what they're seeing with experiments. I'm pretty sure it has to do with, and and we'll get to that property later on. If I'm pretty sure it has to do with estimating uh, the heat of detonation uh, for these different compounds, and they just noticed that if the oxygen balance is less than this number, um, if they estimate the products using uh, these modified KW rules, they get better results. I think okay. it has nothing more than that. Uh, in the explosives uh, and multi-phase combustion community, there are a lot of real empirical sort of um, uh, based observations like this, okay? Um, but if you want to get the real products uh, you need to do a more formal equilibrium analysis. And so, and so if you work for the Department of Energy or the DOD, or you're a contractor for them, you have access to these, to these great tools uh, that can do the nice detailed chemical e equilibrium analysis. Uh, with like a code cheetah or oh. talking about cheetah? Yep, either cheetah or tiger. Uh, okay. There's another one that's named after a, a big cat too. I don't know why the DOE names all their equilibrium codes off of big cats, but, but they do. Um, yeah, and so there are these great tools called Cheetah uh, and Tiger that can actually estimate these products um, um, <clears throat> and with a lot more uh, exactly. Okay, and we will get into, uh, uh, get into a little bit in this class as to how those uh, codes work. Um, okay, so any questions on this? Okay, so now we'll just continue with this. I'm just going to state the rules um, that now there's a whole wide variety of fuels and oxidizers, especially in this day and age. Uh, they are making materials called reactive materials, and those are and those are metals uh, not mixed at the molecular level, but they contain fluorines and they contain aluminum and they contain all sorts of uh, crazy kooky uh, uh, crazy kooky ingredients, and so. If you want to find the oxygen balance for those materials, uh, you can have fluorine and chlorine and all sorts of metals. And so they start getting a lot more complicated. Um, and so you need to apply an oxidizer preference uh, for those. You know, fluorine will, uh, is the most reactive oxidizer. Uh, chlorine is in second place, and oxygen is in third place. And so you basically burn, uh, you basically react with all the available fluorine atoms first. Then you react, uh, then after all the fluorine is consumed, you would react with all the available chlorine. Then after that's consumed, you would then react with all the available oxygen. And if you have metals, uh, such as aluminum, uh, which is a classic ingredient, uh, it's used in a lot of rocket fuels. Uh, and metals are way more reactive than either hydrogen or carbon by far. And so basically the preference is that the metals react with the oxidizers first. And uh, I don't know if there are any rules of thumb for if you have multiple metals, which ones react first or not. I think if you get into that crazy of a compound that has say three different metals, um, I think all bets are off. <laughs> I, I think they're just gonna go to the, uh, they're gonna go to the laboratory and actually estimate uh, all the properties, okay? But for these compounds, uh, if uh, you are given one and you need a back of the envelope calculation to determine what oxidizers it's going to be, uh, you need to adjust the, uh, the, the Kistiakowsky-Wilson the Kistiakowsky rules. 
And essentially, it's just based on this oxidizer preference and the oxidation of the metals. So first, since the, uh, since the metals uh, and the fluorine are the most reactive, first the metal and the fluorine will basically react to form a stable metal fluoride. And again, those stable metal fluorides are available in the table that I showed uh, on Wednesday. Then if there's any metal left and you have chlorine atoms, those react to form a stable metal chloride. Then, um, and then, uh, then here the rules get a bit a, get a get a bit more a bit more fuzzy. But I see more often that um, that after you consume all the metal, if there's any available of fluorine or chlorine, they will preferentially react with the hydrogen first. So step three would be uh, would be that the hydrogen and the fluorine uh, they react to form hydrogen fluoride. Then if there's any chlorine and hydrogen left, those react to form uh, HCl. And then so on and so forth. If there's uh, carbon and fluorine left, uh, they will, uh, those will react to form carbon tetrafluoride. If there's, uh, if there's carbon and, and any chlorine atoms, those react to form uh, carbon tetrachloride. Then, if there's still any metal left, uh, those then can finally react with uh, those can finally react with the oxygen uh, to form the state uh, to form the uh, to form the state to form the stable metal oxide. And again, the list of stable metal oxides are available in the table uh, in the slides that I gave in what uh, slide set number two. Then finally, uh, you now only presumably have oxygen and carbon and hydrogen left. Then you use the KW or the modified KW rules. So there's a whole lot of extra steps involved. Um, I'm not going to go through any uh, examples right now, uh, uh, basically, uh, uh, basically with that. And these are assumed to be in sort of the fully burned state. And they, these are just rules of thumb. Uh, if you need good numbers, you can use CEA if your pressure is not too high. And I'll give you a homework problem with that. Uh, it's an online NASA tool. Uh, it used to be available to use on your computer, uh, but they took that away and they put it online and their online tool, it, it, it keeps getting worse and worse and worse as they modify it. Uh, so, um, but, I'll, but, but I'll, I'll have you have some experience using CA. Uh, there's a code that can do these kinds of things called Cheetah. And that will, as I said earlier, that will consider the full chemical equilibrium analysis uh, using very good uh, e equations of state uh, for all these multi-phase mixtures at extremely high pressures. Okay, and so, uh, but cheetah uh, again, that's available if you work if you if you work for the DOD or the DOE or you're a contractor for the DOD or DOE. Uh, uh, us uh, civilians uh, cannot get our hands on that code. So in this class, I will not be showing you how to use cheetah, but um, uh, but you but for a homework problem, you will be using CEA. Uh, online. Okay, are there any questions? Okay, and there's just another little caveat uh, with this is that those, uh, the oxidation rules discuss the final products, um, but, that, but that does not say anything about how long it takes to oxidize all of those components. And so some components actually burn much more slowly than basically some of the others. And so, for example, uh, some components, uh, they react much more slowly than others. So for example, if you have metal particles that are embedded into the propellant, uh, they will react much more slowly than the energetic materials themselves. And so a classic example would be aluminum particles. So here, this is just uh, a, um, uh, from basically Dan, uh, Dan Gildenbecker's group at Sandia National Lab. Uh, they just published a, a fairly recent paper in combustion in flame where they did some nice visualization of burning propellant strands. So they have a piece of solid propellant and they embed a bunch of aluminum particles. Again, this sounds kind of crazy, but um, uh, aluminum particles have been an additive for rocket fuel for well over 50 years. And so uh, what happens then is these aluminum particles melt and then they get ejected into the flow that is produced by the by the by the by the burning by the burning propellant, and so basically what you see here are these ejected aluminum particles that are burning, 
But now what the aluminum particles are burning in uh, is not air. The aluminum particles are burning in the combustion products of the, of the energetic material itself. And so and basically in this region here be, uh, between the particles is just a, are, are just the, are, are basically more or less the, um, um, uh, if, if say this, if say, if this propellant was RDX, the gas in the region between the aluminum particles would be the decomposition products of RDX. And the aluminum particles are actually burning with that. Okay, and so you don't need to, you know, so basically if you want to study how these particles burn, you do not want to start the products at their fully oxidized state, but basically somewhere in the middle. Um, and the reason being that you'd want to consider that is aluminum particles uh, will actually burn uh, in water vapor. And so um, again, aluminum is very, is extremely reactive. It will actually rip the hydrogen or it will rip the oxygen molecules off of the hydrogen atoms uh, in, uh, in water vapor. It will even react with carbon dioxide. Okay. And so, um, <clears throat> and so that's just a little sort of gotcha. And basically for our project where we are studying the burning of aluminum particles by a high explosive charge, we basically, uh, we, we basically um, uh, when we start the calculation, we do not start at the fully oxidized state. We start at a partially oxidized state uh, that just considers the decomposition products of the, uh, of the high explosive itself. Okay. And so uh, that's it for the basics of energetic materials. I'll, I'll be making a homework over the weekend and you'll have some experience doing oxygen balances and things like that. Okay, and so now we're going to start uh, with slide set number three, which I just uploaded this morning. It was about 10 minutes before class started, but I needed to uh, fix a few things uh, with it. So I'll make it a little bit bigger. Professor, we've been, we've used the words uh, reactivity a few times. And, and is that just defined as, I guess, how bad a molecule wants to steal an electron from another molecule, like the yeah. difference in electronegativity versus. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm not going to formally define it, but if a but if a fuel and oxidizer are, what I mean, if they are more if they are more reactive, that basically means that um, uh, that they they very much want to react, and that. Um, um, Sort of, yeah, I sort of mean that in a more colloquial kind of sense, but it uh, it just means that they have a very high propensity to oxidize molecules. Uh, like, say, fluorine is again, as I say, extremely reactive. And basically, what I mean by that is, it will take uh, um, uh, it will it will actually oxidize uh, normal oxides that we consider nice and stable, like say aluminum oxide or sapphire. Is a is is normally an extremely stable oxide, but if you have fluorine, uh, it will it's it is so reactive. It will actually uh, it it will actually it will actually react with the stable aluminum oxide or sapphire. And so basically, when I say a like molecule is more or less reactive, it's just a sort of relative comparison of you know how like basically um, how. It's, pro, it's sort of propensity to burn. Uh, probably materials, and we're not gonna go over them too much in this class, all, but I will mention what they are. Materials that have, that are classically the highest reactive uh, burning materials that I can think of would be hyper, would, would be hypergolic, uh, uh, hypergolic uh, materials. And a hypergolic is you have a fuel and an oxidizer and they are so reactive that to get them to burn, all they have to do is touch. You uh, is that you don't even have to heat them up, and so those are used in some rockets uh, where you're where you're in a very cold application uh, where where it's not practical to do to use a formal uh, igniter like in a like in a, in a space thruster or something like that, and so um, and if you and so those have to be in that kind of environment where to get them to start to burn, all you need to do is get the fuel and the oxidizer to touch. Uh, you need two very extremely reactive compounds. If you have a normal hydrocarbon, which isn't too terribly 
are reactive and they're at room temperature, you can basically touch pure oxygen with pure, say, methane, and they're not going to do anything. Um, but yeah, okay. <coughs> so it's just a sort of colloquial, um, like relative uh, comparison of its of its propensity to burn. Okay. So now moving on to slide set three, uh, we're going to get into uh, start getting into the chemical thermodynamics, and so. This is part three, we'll be dealing with ideal gases and part four is dealing with real gases. And so here we'll just discuss what to do with mixtures of ideal gases, uh, briefly discuss the internal energy, enthalpy and enthalpy of formation, the heat of reaction and just briefly discuss the adiabatic flame temperature. Okay, and um, for those of you who joined again, um, if uh, if you have not had a formal course in combustion, again, I'm going to go through these pretty fast so we can get to the more specifics that are associated with multi-phase and energetic, uh, multi-phase combustion and, ener and, and, and energetic uh, materials. But uh, with Ken Coe's book right here, uh, you can get the low price edition of this book for about 30 bucks. Uh, and also Stephen Turns, uh, you can get the low price edition of, of basically his book, uh, An Introduction to Combustion, for also about $30. And so, uh, a, so there's a lot more detail on the enthalpy of formation and things like that as to why they're needed uh, that will be in those books. So I'll just be discussing what they are and basically, and basically skipping straight to, straight to the results. Okay. So first we just need to discuss to uh, refresh your memory on the ideal gas equation state. Uh, it is used in most traditional combustion applications under quote normal uh, pressure conditions. Um, and that's just given by the equation state that P is equal to rho RT or equivalently uh, P is equal to the molar concentration times the universal gas constant times T, okay? where again, the total concentration is just the sum of all the concentrations of all the different species. Now, in a lot of, in, for a lot of our energetic uh, materials, uh, we will not be under quote, normal pressure conditions. We will be at very high pressures. Or even if you're designing a modern gas turbine combustor or, or something like that, uh, for emission, for efficiency purposes, uh, they're starting to crank the pressure up higher and higher and higher. And you're starting to get very close to the critical point for a lot of these compounds. And so the ideal gas, uh, again, it's still used a lot, but there's starting to be some applications to where, you, it's, it, where using the ideal gas law is starting to become iffy. And, and, and starting next week, we are gonna discuss, uh, discuss some of the equations of state that, uh, 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 that are used for, uh, that are used for uh, such conditions. And here are used the universal gas constant. So it's a number that you've used quite a bit. Uh, and the gas constant R is just based on the mixture of, uh, if you have a mixture of say H2 and O2 and H2O and CO2, you need to determine a mean gas constant for that entire mixture. And so that, and so, and so, and so that gas constant for the mixture is just the, is just the, is just the universal gas constant divided by the molecular weight of the mixture. Okay, and then uh, and then if you then you can substitute in the de the definition of the of the of the molecular weight of the mixture, uh, and then you can base it off the mass fraction or the mole fraction, whichever is more convenient uh, for a, a given calculation. And this definition here for the gas constant that is independent of the equation of state. Okay, and the ideal gas law, what makes it ideal. Is that you? Is that it does not consider any of the volume as taken up by all the molecules. So you can imagine at a very high pressure, all the molecules are jammed very close together, and the fact that the molecules are taking up space uh, becomes important. So that's one reason why the ideal gas law becomes invalid at very high pressures. And then also, if you remember from your physics or chemistry classes, around each molecule, there's sort of this attraction and uh, or a repulsion force field that is surrounding each molecule. That if the molecules get start, start getting too close together, uh, they start to push each other away. And so, if you are jamming molecules at very high pressure and they're very close together, those forces start to become 
important too, and those are not considered by the ideal gas law. And we will be discussing some equation states that start to include those effects uh, next week. Okay, then from your thermodynamics, uh, if you remember, there's there is uh, there is the internal energy uh, and the enthalpy, and so for the ideal gas, uh, uh, I'm going to use a superscript IG uh, to distinguish the real gas uh, enthalpy from the ideal gas enthalpy, and the reason I do that will make much more sense in the next uh, slide. And so the ideal gas enthalpy on a molar basis. Uh, properties that have a molar basis will have an overbar. And so here, this would be on a molar basis, I mean, it'd be a joule per kmol or a joule per mole rather than a joule per kilogram. Okay. And if you have a mixture of different gases, like say H2 and O2 and CO2, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the enthalpy for the mixture is defined as the sum of the mole fraction times uh, 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 times the enthalpy for each component. And it's the same thing for the constant pressure specific heat for the ideal gas. Okay. Then using the constant pressure specific heat, uh, we can find the, uh, 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 we can define the enthalpy for uh, species I on a molar basis as the integral of CP uh, over uh, um, uh, DT over a range of T ref to T uh, for combustion. Uh, this is an example that I go through when I teach the other combustion class. Uh, for combustion, there is a huge change of temperature from 300 to up to 3000 or 3500 Kelvin. You cannot assume constant specific heat. If you can assume constant specific heat uh, at a 300 Kelvin, if you compute the temperature of burning hydrogen and oxygen, you'll get, I can't remember what the number is, you'll get like 7,000 Kelvin if you use uh, the specific heat uh, 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 at 300 Kelvin. So you get a completely incorrect answer. And so you need to do this formal integral here. Uh, and I'll show uh, how that's done. And you guys will not be doing these integrals by hand because uh, they're just tedious, but we'll be using something called Cantera that will basically do this for you. Um, and then now uh, when we are dealing with mixtures of different gases, uh, we need to consider the fact that there is chemical energy associated that's stored in the bonds of the molecule. And so we need to add a constant to each enthalpy for each species, and that's called the enthalpy of formation. Uh, and this is, uh, and basically, you, you could, and basically you could, you could consider this as sort of an unknown constant uh, for each species that is basically added. And physically, it represents the amount of chemical potential energy that's stored in the bonds for each of the molecules. And it's given at, uh, at some pressure P naught. That's what this little circle means. Uh, and it's given at T ref. And so typically, P naught will, uh, will be basically one atmosphere uh, and 25 degrees Celsius. Uh, I think technically, the definition has changed to one bar uh, rather than one atmosphere. but uh, uh, numerically, it changes almost nothing. Okay, um, I've already said this, and the enthalpy of formation is equal to zero by definition for elements that are occurring at their uh, that are occurring at their state uh, p naught and t naught, and so elements at their naturally occurring state are if you think of uh, basically ambient uh, conditions and what is the natural state of nitrogen. It's uh, it is in the N two molecule, and so the and so the enthalpy of formation of N two is zero. The enthalpy of formation of uh, uh, um, uh, of of uh, of oxygen is zero because uh, of of O two is zero. Things like that. Okay, and then um, and so this is that actually. Okay, and so then, um, so that should be pretty straightforward. It's just uh, just like dealing with the enthalpy that you've dealt with since uh, since your undergrad thermo. It's just for it's just a you got to consider the fact that you have a mixture of different gases, and you need to consider all the contributions to uh, to the enthalpy for all of those different gases. 
And you need to consider all the chemical energy that is stored in the bonds of all the molecules too. Okay, and really this enthalpy of formation is it just puts the enthalpy of all the different gases on, uh, on an absolute scale so that the enthalpy of H2 can, uh, uh, that it can be compared um, uh, in a consistent fashion to the enthalpy of say CO2. Okay, it, it basically puts all the species enthalpies on an absolute scale. Okay. And similar, we can define uh, an ideal gas. Uh, uh, we can ideal. We can define an ideal gas internal energy. Uh, I use the symbol E. I don't use U because we'll be doing combustion and we'll have flow. And then, if any of you worked in uh, worked in fluid mechanics or combustion or anything like that, you know that U is a variable that is used way too often. And so I use small E for the internal energy. But again, that's just the, that, that is used, the internal energy for a mixture is defined the same way as it is for, for basically, uh, uh, for, uh, uh, for the enthalpy and it's based on the sum of the mole fractions. And then again, uh, and then, then uh, the internal energy for species I is very similar to the internal energy or the, uh, the, for the enthalpy for species I except for you integrate the constant volume specific heat, but you still add the enthalpy, uh, you still add the same enthalpy uh, of formation. Okay, now what is this enthalpy of formation? I just scanned some tables from uh, basically Cooper's book, uh, Explosive Engineering, here's a very nice table. Uh, and I put these here in full, uh, probably breaking some copyright rules, but they're just tables, so I don't think they care too much. Okay, and so, here they got the um, uh, uh, the enthalpy of formation, and for a whole bunch of compounds, I'm not going to go through this table, uh, but just to note that if there's any um, O2, they don't even have those because they're zero. Okay, but anyways, uh, but in this table, uh, the units are in kkels per gram mole. Uh, if you work in combustion, you will be, you will be encountering the units of uh, kilocalories quite a bit. Okay, so just sort of get used to that. This is one of the most comprehensive tables that I could find. Okay, and just notice that they're quite often negative, uh, but the enthalpy of formation is sometimes positive too. Okay, then let's see. There's the idea of this entropy. And again, uh, the mixture entropy, again, the, uh, uh, the overbar denotes a molar basis. It's just based off the sum of the mole fraction times the, uh, times the molar entropy for basically all the species. And where basically the molar entropy for a species is very similar to the ideal gas entropy that you guys have been using since your thermodynamics days, where, where, we, have, uh, where we have the integral of Cp over T dt minus r, uh, basically minus r times the log of basically p divided by uh, p naught. There are some gotchas with this, is that this is p sub i, not p. And pi is defined to be the partial pressure of species i. And basically, this has to do with an entropy that is due, that is basically due to mixing of two different gases. That if I have, say, hydrogen here and oxygen here, and and there's a barrier and there's a barrier uh, and there's a there's a barrier between them. If I release the barrier, these hydrogen uh, all these hydrogen atoms and the oxygen molecules are going to mix. And say they're at a low temperature, so they are not going to burn. But there but then at an infinite uh, if we allow time to go to a full a full equilibrium state. The hydrogen atoms and the oxygen are, and the oxygen molecules are going to be perfectly mixed, and there's going to be an entropy, an entropy associated with uh, an entropy associated with that mixing, and that is basically what this term is. Because if you want to unmix those molecules, you're going to have to take do a lot of work to basically one by one pluck out all the hydrogen atoms and basically move them and separate them yourself manually. Whereas the mixing occurred just naturally by itself, you didn't have to do anything. Okay, and this uh, and this and this SI naught at a reference temperature that is similar in concept to the enthalpy of formation. This puts the entropy of all the different species on an absolute scale, 
Uh, and that scaling is based uh, on the third law of thermodynamics that the entropy of a perfect crystal is zero at zero Kelvin. Okay, and so this is just very similar to what you guys have been uh, been using in your thermodynamics. And the last slide for the week, and I will note there is no class on Monday due to uh, due to M due to MLK Day. Um, but if you want to uh, convert between the uh, between a between the mass based properties, which are per which are per unit kilogram, which is what you guys are, are like used to using, uh, and molar based properties. Uh, which are per unit k mol, uh, you just basically multiply them by a by a by the uh, molecular weight using this uh, basically using these relationships here. So you can go to or, uh, to and from a molar based uh, quantity just by multiplying by a uh, molecular weight. Okay, so I guess that's it for the week. Are there any questions? Not for me. Okay. Well, have a good weekend. Uh, we'll see you on Wednesday. Have a good weekend. Thank you. Yep. Have a good one. Thank you. Thank you.